Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for turning up. This is the third or fourth in our series of Time Matters seminars. And the first that we've actually had an outside speaker, um, Stuart Armstrong's come up from Oxford University um, with the baby and an all on train, I think. No, no, the baby stays in Oxford. All oh, right. <laughs> um, and he's from the modestly named Institute of Future. Future of Humanity Institute, and it's going to be talking to us about the future. Right, so it's about the future, uh, what we can know about it, um, and what we can do about it if we care about it, which we should. Um, now the plan of this talk is that I'm, uh, I'm going to start by inflicting future shock on you, uh, which is... Um, not nearly as scary as it sounds. Uh, then we'll have a look at what the important issues are, uh, what we do at our institute, um, how to predict stuff. Uh, that section will mainly be about how not to predict stuff. Um, the expertise and biases which are connected with that. Existential risks, uh, I have big important things to worry about, and some great possibilities which I'll touch in at the end. Because Basically, if we don't mess up, we've probably got a really great time ahead of us. Now, uh, the future shock is that we underestimate sometimes the impact of small transformations. Um, and just to sort of broaden our horizons, I'm going to start with a hypothetical and see where it leads. The small hypothetical that I'm going to start with is, what if lie detectors really worked? like some sciencey thing or micro-expression, or the details don't matter, but what if they actually worked? How could our society get transformed by this? Well, first of all, let's have a think about what would happen in tomorrow's court. Uh, we have centuries of legal tradition, lots of sort of interesting philosophy written about this, but tomorrow's court would probably be reduced to that and would be potentially over in 30 seconds. So if you just think, of course, not all of legal tradition would be destroyed, but a, a, lo a lot of the courtroom and tradition would. And this is a change that could happen from just effective lie detection. Um, tomorrow's job interview might be similarly simplified. What about tomorrow's relationships? Well, I hope they won't be over in only 30 seconds. But maybe we should start thinking a bit larger scale. What about politicians? Would it be sufficient to run politicians, have them promise things, run them through a lie detector, and then let them go with that? Well, this is still a bit sort of small scale. What about international relations? Um, there's a whole lot of treaties that could get done today but that aren't done because people can't trust each other and can't check up on each other. What could happen if you just passed a treaty and then checked with the leaders that they were abiding by it? The important bit of this is that it's mutual, so even uh, groups that hate each other would still be able to trust each other. Anyway, that's, the, uh, that's uh, just the introduction. Now. At the Future of Humanity Institute, we like to focus almost exclusively on the important issues. And the question is, well, why? Well, the silly answer is because they're important. But what this hides is because they are very important. The top issues or the top problems have an impact uh, sort of completely disproportionate. Just Let's just pick a man. This is... Franz Haber. Uh, he could probably be considered the father of chemical warfare. And if you wanted to total up the uh, amount of deaths he caused, you could get at least a few million uh, directly or indirectly. However, it is an incredibly positive thing that this man was born because he also developed the Haber Bosch process uh, with which we fix nitrogen into fertilizers. And we feed about half the world, at least, um, using this type of fertilizer today. 
Um, uh, half the world's food um, is based on nitrogen derived from this process. On a less morally ambiguous, uh, we have here Norman Borlaug, father of the Green Revolution, which is the reason that Mexico and India can actually do something like feed their populations at the moment. Uh, numbers are difficult to come by, but let's give him a quarter of a billion lives. Um, Jenner, the inventor of the smallpox vaccine, uh, you can give another half billion at least. So basically at the top, the very top impacts are massive, disproportionate in the positive and the negative direction. So even having a small chance of affecting uh, a huge change um, will drown out uh, a lot of uh, little changes. Now, some people ask uh, when I say this, should we not solve all issues, uh, the big ones and the small ones? Yes, of course, but there are opportunity costs. Um, every time you're researching a minor problem is effort that you're not doing, uh, potentially for a major problem. Um, an illustration of this is that in the 1920s, Haber did an exhaustive search for a method to extract gold from seawater. Um, now, he did this after having perfected the Haber-Bosch process, so he kind of already had done his big achievement. But think of the tragedy that it would have been if he'd done it instead. Um, and there may be quite a lot of uh, inventors uh, or all sorts in the history of humanity who have wasted their efforts and could have had massive impact if only they'd looked out for the big issues. Now, um, so how to implement this in practice, look at the big issues? Well, we're a research institute, so we do it through research. Um, the platonic idea of what a researcher is, is that you get to have cool ideas, have fun discussions about them, look at the literature, write it all up for publication, and hopefully you find the truth through this process. Of course, since there's something called the real world, don't you hate that place? Um, there's a bunch of other considerations in a researcher's life, um, none of which are particularly enjoyable. But that's sort of for normal researchers. Uh, what if you care? Um, and this is something that the FHI has been very fiendish. They got me uh, to work for them, first of all, with all the cool problems, and I realized after a while that I actually started caring about humanity and about resolving this, so they basically had me trapped, which is very vicious of them. But um, if you care, well, the two most important things are finding the truth, which is considerably harder than the rest of the platonic academics uh, career, and not the impact factors, but having an impact on the world. I'll, I won't do too much on the impact because it's difficult and uh, sometimes not all that interesting, and some of it is actually classified. But just to, the, the basic idea is you want to do a policy change, and it has to be on important problems. It's actually surprisingly easy to do it on important problems because um, very few people are researching important problems. Um, it's really depressing how few rivals we have. Um, and, but policy change is the key thing. Um, if something happened that would have happened anyway, it doesn't actually matter whether you can claim credit for it. Uh, it's only if something happened that wouldn't have happened. And we have a variety of levers that we uh, pull on. Um, the media, the last one, is probably the most fun, but is the one that's also the, the hardest to be to quantify. Um, now, m my sort of media story is that I sort of got to um, uh, John's attention here, uh, I believe, after I was on the Today Show. Um, and when I was first asked to go on the radio, this was my vision of what would happen. This is the actuality of what happened. I was put in a room alone with headphones on 
listening to the radio show and then suddenly they mentioned Stuart Armstrong and then people around the country heard whatever I was coming up with. And after it was finished, there was a empty corridor as I showed myself out. So not exactly the high glamour thing that I was expecting. But uh, on impact, we've got some people, like this is Toby Orr uh, from the Institute, um, going to number 10 uh, for his uh, effective altruism um, ideas. So there are other uh, avenues of impact that are probably more, uh, more effective. But that's enough about impact. Let's have a look at truth. This is sort of the branching map of what the future could hold. It branches and branches, except all of these are millions and infinity of branches at each second. And you will be here, and, but what can we, how can we know about that today and what can we plan about it today? Um, now, to illustrate the difficulty of the problem, this is a late 19th century French family. Um, and if you just imagine the changes that the youngest generation there lived through, through the 20th century, through the wars, the sexual revolution, um, the completely ch uh, changing nature of the family itself, but you'd ask them then what they would have predicted, what they would have thought of, um, well, it would have been spectacularly wrong. So. It is a bit of a challenge, and I'm not so much in this talk going to go into how we do get results as to how we avoid getting the wrong results, um, which is somewhat more important. Uh, so how could we ever predict anything? It's not sort of completely hopeless. This is Moore's law in um, computing, which has been around for 50 odd years and has been followed pretty accurately. Um, economic growth is about 2% a year on average, and this is very consistent. There will be elections in Sweden. Um, that doesn't sound like much, it sounds trivial, but it's actually a very specific prediction about how lots, large groups of people are going to behave, and yet we're sort of completely confident that there will be elections in Sweden when they next come about. So, some things we can predict. Others, we kind of are a lot worse at. Um, this is Sir John Eric Erishan saying that we're basically never going to do any surgery in the abdomen. Um, stocks in 1929 have reached a high plateau. Television wouldn't last. The Beatles have no future in show business. And in 1992, um, we may be witnessing um, well, Western liberal democracy all over the world. We may have been witnessing, we didn't. But um, when looking at all these sort of ridiculously wrong predictions, we have to beware um, hindsight bias. Because just because they're wrong and we can tell that they were wrong, doesn't mean that it would have been easy to tell so at the time. The people who did those predictions, all of them were experts. All of them knew so much about the field of which they were talking about. Um, and if someone at the time had said, no, you're completely wrong, they would, have, they would not have had a leg to stand on, even though they turned out uh, to, be, uh, to be off, off the mark. Um, so again, so this is how expert predictions compare. These are fields arranged by uh, purity. Um, in the XKCD cartoon. It's also quite uh, close to fields arranged by predictability, how reliable the predictions are in each one. Uh, let's put economists there and historians down there. Um, the reason why the predictions are more or less accurate is that each one has different tools. The lucky mathematicians have deductive logic. Uh, you have stronger or weaker uh, versions of the scientific method down to the poor historians who have nothing but past examples to go on. However, when it comes to most future predictors, they don't even have that. Um, like artificial intelligence is one I've looked into quite a lot. How are you going to predict on artificial intelligence which has never existed in the history of humanity? Uh, so this is dependent on expert opinion, and expert opinion is considerably uh, less reliable than the other tools. 
Now, another thing you might think is that as you go down here and your predictions become less reliable, then the people who hold them become more tentative and more willing to entertain opposing points of view. No. Let's just take some economists. This is Paul Krugman saying very nice things about the Chicago economist. These are Chicago economists um, responding in, a, in an equally generous fashion. Um, and this economy is a field where you adjust your quarterly GDPs, you know those numbers you report. Um, they're generally adjusted later by about 1.7 points up or down, which is enough to swing you in and out of a recession. So this a field with this lack of reliability is where people have such determined opinions. And it's very annoying because both of these people are experts. There's something in their mind that we really want to get to, uh, but we can't. At least we can't while they're saying opposite things. Because this is sort of the cartoon um, version of disagreement, is that in our heads we have a bunch of things, life, experience, evidence, and lots of good things, and let's be honest, some biases and rationalizations, and all this leads to a reasonable conclusion. And what about all those vicious people who disagree with us? Well, it's exactly the same process. Except from inside our head, this is all we can see. So, even the fact that people disagree with us, the fact that we feel that we are correct, we feel strongly that we are correct, is no evidence at all that we are correct. Because that is what we would feel anyway, and that's what our opponents feel. They're only, it's, your, our opinions are only relevant if there's an objective way of saying that yes, these are accurate, these are better. And of course, you can't just let everybody pick their own objectivity criteria, because then they'll just pick the ones that benefit them. Uh, so let's have a look, a little bit more look at the biases um, of experts and of everyone else. This, and the reason as I say we look at biases, it's much easier to be wrong than to be right, uh, when predict, uh, especially when talking about the future. So this is an illustrative bias. Um, Linda is a 31-year-old, single, outspoken. Incidentally, the biases I'm going to go through, um, I was trapped by all but one of them. So uh, it is very easy to get caught. Um, there's a description of someone uh, which is basically an intelligent girl with a social conscious. Then people are asked to rank the following statements from most probable to least probable what she's doing. Um, you you don't need to do it particularly because there's a trick only these two statements are important. And most people rank eight as more likely than six, which is impossible. There is no way that it's more likely to be a bank teller and something than it is to be a bank teller. It's just that this sounds like a better description of Linda. Um, there's a similar thing with rolling dice. You roll dice which have green is slightly more likely than red. And you're asked, if you have three sequences, which one would you want to bet on to appear? And if that sequence appears in, say, 20 times dice, you'll get a certain amount of money. Which one would you prefer to bet on? Here you might just want to think for a second which one you would go for. Again, the trap is that if you look at number two, this sequence, this is exactly the same as sequence number one. You cannot get sequence two without getting sequence one. There is no point on betting on sequence two, yet most people will bet on sequence two because it looks more like what you would expect a loaded dice to come up with. Uh, other biases, this one is, um, how much time? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so then I won't go into too much detail about this. Is the Ale paradox? Um, basically, there are two experiments, and in each experiment, you're offered a choice between two gambles. In the first one, you're offered between a million dollars cold cash up front, and in the uh, or you get a million dollars 
with 89% probability, you get 5 million with 10% probability, but there's a 1% chance that you get nothing. In, uh, and most people in this choose the first option. The second one, uh, you, get, uh, you get nothing with 89% probability, uh, but if you choose the first gamble, you have 11% probability of getting a million, and if you choose the second gamble, you have 10% probability of, choosing five, of getting 5 million. Um, and most people here choose the second gamble, because it's practically the same thing. Let's go for the 5 million. Um, and so this is the options that most people choose. Now, this, it doesn't work only for money. If you look in terms of qualities, uh, quality adjusted life years, so health, healthy extent, life extension, then people do, tend to do the same options. Except here's the trick. Notice in this bar, in gamble 1A and gamble 1B, that part is the same. In gamble 2A and gamble 2B, that part is the same. This top row does not distinguish between 1A and 1B and does not distinguish between 2A and 2B. These are options that are the same. So if we remove that option, which we should be able to because it doesn't distinguish between the two, and we're left with this and we will adjust the probabilities to what left, you notice we have exactly the same gambles now. And still have the preference that 1A is better than 1B and 2B is better than 2A, even though once we removed the bit that is indistinguishable, it's exactly the same. Um, and you might think that this is a sort of esoteric example, after all. It's not often that experimenters come to you in the street and offer you the opportunity of winning um, $5 million, or at least if there is, I should move to Preston uh, immediately. But the errors like this are the reason why um, banks make a fortune on the stock market by certain types of arbitrage. Um, and uh, we'll go into examples of insurance and warranties as well. Making these kind of errors costs a lot of money to a lot of people. Uh, and the last uh, important bias I'm going to mention is that we literally believe everything we hear. This is, um, I'm replicating an experiment that's been done in slightly different circumstances, but this is Louis Mathieu Mollet, um, a French politician of the 19th century. And then people were shown true and false statements. Um, the true statements are colored in green, like he was Prime Minister of France for a day, followed by the false statements in red, that he resisted Napoleon's rise to power. Another true statement, and another false statement. <laughs> now, if you did this to people, and then asked them later on, can you say what was true, what was false, they will remember. They will remember. However, if you put cognitive load on them, so make their brain stressed or worried, in this case it was remember this sequence of digits while doing the experiment, so that they couldn't focus properly, and then they remembered it all as true. So it seems that our mind accepts everything we read or see, and then it takes a special effort to reject it. And if we're overloaded or distracted or just not even paying any attention, that effort doesn't happen, and we just and we suck it in. Another uh, feature here is like to strangle goats in bed. That's extremely salient and extremely memorable. And since nobody knows anything about Louis Mathieu Mollet except for some historians, I am pretty sure that in five years' time, if you see that name again, and if you remember anything from this uh, lecture, a vague image of goats or strangling goats may come up, even though I'm, and I'm emphasizing it again, it is completely false, but, but memorable, and it will stick around, and our memories are full of things like that. So, how does this matter in practice? Well, companies, newspaper, and political parties exploit all these biases to sell us products and opinions. Um, they can put it at risk of death. Um, the Allais paradox for health care 
it happens. People make very poor decisions for their health or for the health of others, and people die uh, because of things like that. Um, nine of, I'm not immune, you're not immune here, especially under stress or cognitive load. You might think, yes, I would not fall for that trap, and I haven't fallen for that trap, but you're thinking about the examples where you were aware, you were awake, you were focused. But all the stuff where we're in a hurry or we don't pay any attention, that's the stuff that gets us. Um, my, some example, well, it's not quite, a, an example that I like because it sort of shows some of the ridiculousness is terrorism insurance while flying. Um, you can get people to pay more for terrorist insurance when you fly than if you get them to pay for everything insurance. Um, just by restricting it and by mentioning that, it conserves an image and people, as I say, pay more money. Um, warranties exploit this a lot and insurance exploits this a lot. There's a lot of tricks that they use. The basic rule is all warranties, except for things that you cannot afford to lose, are worthless. Um, uh, life insurance, yes, health insur house insurance, car insurance maybe, but all the all the other things, insurance on your TV, you might say, well, this purchases me a peace of mind. The company is better than you at figuring out how likely it is you'll trigger on this insurance. So you will lose money in expectation every time you buy it. So what that means is, don't buy any insurances, and when something breaks, use the money you've saved to buy it again. Um, this is still true for the big stuff like house insurance, you still expect to lose money, except the thing is, you can't afford to lose your house, so that, um, you can't just buy another house out of the savings that you've made for not paying insurance on your television, for instance. Right, so that's sort of the bad, some bad stuff to look at, but when are experts good? Uh, fortunately, we have some results on that as well. It turns out it's connected much more strongly with tasks than with actual expertise. Um, that tasks which feature things in the left column tend to have very, experts that are very competent on them, and tasks which feature the stuff in the right column tend to have experts that are very poor on them. Um, the three most important uh, I see are uh, these three, with especially feedback. Um, for an example, um, anesthesiologists are real experts and they're very good at what they do. Doctors who interpret mammograms are not, and they're not very good, and computer programs can perform practically as good as they can and will probably get better soon. Why? Well, an anesthesiologist gets feedback pretty quickly. The patient is either A, conscious, or B, dead. In both cases, it's clear that the mistake has been made. Um, the mammogram interpreter will get feedback six months later, maybe, probably never. So it becomes hard, like, and there's certain nurses, for instance, are experts at some tasks and not experts at others, um, the same nurse, so it's not connected with the person, but with the task. I've been looking at um, artificial intelligence predictions, uh, one where I would expect, and that task generally has all, is almost all in the poor performance uh, arena, especially on the lack of feedback. Um, and so just looking at this, we would expect that people predicting dates for artificial intelligence developments would be bad at it, and they are so bad at it. These are the date the prediction was made and when the, predict, uh, the AI was supposed to be developed. Um, the bar, between the bars is 20 years, so this has a huge spread. This, incidentally, is Turing's original prediction, and this is the AI winter, um, for those who are interested. But yes, there's no real difference between experts and non-experts, um, and there's no sign that experts are sort of converging on some, on some truth. Now, um, let's... Now that we've sort of um, demoralized ourselves about how difficult it is to predict the future, let's, well, try, try and predict the future. Or at least try and see 
what we try and do to avoid some of the pitfalls is to see the things that could go wrong and try and do things that would prevent them, whether or not uh, they would happen. So what we try and avoid is so-called existential risks. Existential risks are things that are of very high intensity and very high impact. Um, these are some things that are moderate there. You have the so-called global catastrophic risks, which are of slightly higher intensity and impact. And here's the existential risk, the maximum intensity. It's terminal and it's transgenerational. So the things that could either kill all of humanity or dramatically curtail its potential. What do we put in that category? Well, these are the top four that we're looking at. Uh, pandemics, synthetic biology, artificial intelligence, and uh, an oldie but a goodie, nuclear war. Um, three that we're not currently looking at are asteroid impact, nanotechnology, and environmental collapse, mainly because in relative terms these are just not risky enough. Um, incidentally, um, my two preferred existential risks uh, are artificial intelligence and asteroid impact. Um, because they're at opposite ends of the certainty spectrum. Asteroid impact, we know a lot about this. Uh, our uncertainties are tiny, which is why the risk is low, because we found out that the risk is low. Artificial intelligence, we know so little. And all the other ones arrange themselves uh, in between those two. So let's have a look at uh, these uh, risks. I won't go on nuclear war, because that's sort of well known. But these are past events killing more than 100 million. The figures are approximate um, and subject to uh, change. And, but there are, the order of magnitude is correct. Um, the, you get your wars here. You get your bad governments. Uh, you get your bad governments plus lack of governments. Uh, bad governments and anarchy um, are uh, both quite deadly but towering above everything else, you have pandemics. Um, disease is the biggest killer in human history, bar none. And in pandemics, the WHO always overreacts. And why is this? So this is the 2009 swine flu. Worst case scenario, 65,000 killed. Now, the actual deaths were 392. So. Does this mean that they were just fear-mongering? Well, not quite. If you plot your diseases, uh, your pandemic deaths, on a log scale, you get something like this, and it follows what's called a power law. The main point of this is that the main risk is in the tails. Um, the average pandemic has few deaths, but the average death per pandemic is unbounded, is huge. So, or another way of looking at it, um, these, these figures are illustrative rather than exact, is that the majority of deaths you know, through pandemics will be caused by the single biggest pandemic. So had swine flu got out of control, then it would have been, uh, the number of deaths would have been incredible. So that's why the WHO has to overreact to every pandemic, because if it might be the big one, um, incidentally, swine flu, we think, infected about a quarter of the world's population. So even though it wasn't very deadly, it was, turned out to be extremely infectious. Uh, synthetic biology, that's the next one. So what is synthetic biology? Well, that's when you modify cells and living organisms. Uh, and I prefer to think of synthetic biology as pandemics plus human direction. Um, Synthetic biology is currently in the hand of biohackers who are experimenting with it and whose main achievement is, look at all the cool stuff I can do. I hope you're as reassured as I am at this. And my sort of favorite thing, AI, which is nothing like the Terminator. The Terminator has big muscles, an Austrian accent, and no brain. Um, it's basically an armored bear. This is not um, the reason why we should fear uh, artificial intelligence. As you can see here, the dominant species is not the biggest one. So this is a chimp brain. This is a human brain. They're not too dissimilar in 
size and especially not an organization. The chimps have a population of about 200,000 and use basic wooden tools. Humanity, well, we have heavy industry, nuclear weapon, and we're spread across the almost entirety of the globe. Since we've extended our intelligence with computers, we've also landed on the moon, developed hydrogen weapons, and had unprecedented economic growth. So the risk in AI is, what if the entity goes one step or several steps further than that? As I say, there are great uncertainties. This might not happen, but there's definitely a risk of it happening. My sort of model for a dangerous AI would be, and th this is something you could get with pure human level um, intelligence in a machine. You could get a super committee, say get your AI Edison, Einstein, Soros, Clinton, Oprah, Plato, Goebbels, Steve Jobs and Bernie Madoff. Network them all together, give them vast databases, run them at thousands of times human speed. And this sort of super committee which could get copied at will, um, is the entity that, uh, that could be feared. I, it would probably be that the entirety of the internet and possibly the human race would just be a useful resource uh, for whatever this entity had in mind. Now, the AI risk, I won't go into too much details, but the reason why it could be bad is that if it was programmed with sort of naive objectives like this is immediate, uh, but it's very hard to avoid problems like this. Like if we are slightly more sophisticated, and the AI will fight you if you try and prevent it from doing that, because any other option than this would result in humans being less safe and less happy. And you might say, but that's not what we meant. And the AI said, of course I know that's not what you meant. I'm smart, right? But that's what you programmed. Um, slightly more sophisticated approaches try and sort of get it indirectly, like uh, how the AI deduce human preferences from observation. Now, it's not a completely stupid idea, uh, but if you apply it literally, I fear that the entire future of the universe may start to look a lot like this. Or whatever uh, meme is currently overwhelming the internet at the point where the AI is turned on. Now, that's, so that's the sort of look at the negatives. Another thing that we can do is find things that are not problems and put them aside. Overall lack of food, uh, water, and energy are not problems. Uh, there are some caveats, which I'll get to in a second, but these, we could get all our use of desalination, all our current water use across the world from desalination plants for about $2 trillion a year. Um, we could grow our hydropon all, all our current food needs uh, hydroponically between 0.6 to $5.4 trillion a year at current prices, so uh, there are no extra efficiency assumptions. Um, and we could get all our solar, all our energy from solar at about $7 trillion a year. This includes the energy we would need to run the desalination plants. Um, so all in about, we could sort of live, as long as the air is breathable, we could sort of survive at a cost of about 14 trillion, less than $14 trillion a year, maybe closer to 10. Our current energy and food expenditure is $10 trillion a year. So the magnitude is very comparable. As I say, this excludes um, efficiency gains, which we would get if we uh, w went in that direction. Now, this also excludes transition costs, storage costs, and equity, and all those sort of issues. But in an absolute sense, the lack of food, energy, and water is not going to be a problem for the future. And there's also some good stuff. There's some problems that could be solved um, in the way that uh, we've actually solved quite a lot of problems in the past. Um, but absolute poverty could be solved. Um, the sort of uh, manufacturing, there, there are trends. Poverty is getting quite strongly reduced at the moment uh, in things that are never reported anywhere because they're good news. Um, but there are sort of manufacturing things, maybe certain reorganization of social uh, stuff that could get rid of absolute poverty um, entirely. Relative poverty is another thing. 
Um, blue collar crime. This might be on the way out. Um, well, it is on the way out. It's going down all the time. Uh, but with sort of certain surveillance technologies um, that people are wearing all, all the time with them. Um, the, this probably is going to be pushed down as well. Um, war, again, war is going down all the time, and there might be certain things you can do with surveillance and other methods to get rid of it uh, permanently. I mean, since 1953, no great power has fought a great power directly. And this is unheard of in human history. Um, other problems we could solve? Violence in general. Um, well, I mean, between blue-collar crime and war, you've kind of got most of the violence. Now, mental illnesses. Um, there are, with, again, with certain, th uh, with certain surveillance abilities and certain statistical methods, there are ways that you might be able to sort of get rid of it permanently, um, certain, like, if you could get cognitive, if you could get something that was like an AI with cognitive behavior therapy abilities um, in a cell phone, which practically everyone in the world is going to get very soon, these are the kind of things that you could do. Um, disease, um, again, disease, it tends to be the biological interventions are inefficient and slow and technological interventions are a lot faster and we're getting to the point where technology can solve some diseases um, so if we could continue on these lines and some people are also thinking that we might be able to get rid of death um, which I actually think will be a lot less exciting when it happens than, and a lot less transformative than uh, a lot of people think um, but anyway, so there are the, these are the good news. Now, that's the good stuff. Now, there's also the potential great stuff. Here I'm sort of getting somewhat more speculative, but there are some people, some philosophers, and some people in hedonistic theory who think that we could really make things a lot better than what they are now. That there are, if we're currently stars, we could get supernovas of happiness, of meaning, that there is uh, we're kind of blocked by certain biological constraints at the moment, uh, but we could surpass them, and there is a whole unexplored plus aspect uh, of happiness. Maybe something that is as good as being tortured, say, is bad. There's a, at the moment, it seems that there's a little bit of happiness above and a lot of unhappiness below, but there might be uh, huge spaces above. I don't subscribe to this view personally, but it's some do, and I think I should mention it as a possibility. So anyway, um, in conclusion, the future is worth fighting for, and uh, thanks for listening. Thank you.